anytime you want. Okay, hello everybody. Hello. So this these are like our visual guides for today. And there's they stand alone, they have a lot of their own information. But I decided one of the most valuable good things to do. For many, many years I've researched, and every time I found some really great piece of writing about a meaningful subject or event, you remember it. You just you automatically remember it. And today, after a few little preparatory things, uh, I'm going to tell, you know, convey to you the Civil War using as tent poles. We're not going to do the day of the battle, day two of the general. We're not going to go division, corps, you know, regiment, company. We're not going to do that. We'll hit on key points, but I want you to experience the writing as it appears chronologically in the war, and I'll contextualize each of it with quotations. Did it, some of you have a chance to see the video about uh, Mom Wheeler? Yeah. If you, yeah, you know, did you like her? Did you like her, with, or wasn't she interesting? Oh well, yeah, I like what she was trying to do. I just uh, always feel sad for these kids, you know, um, you know what they're what landed them there. You know, sadness. Oh, and those, there's a whole collection. You saw some of these sweet faces. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. and. To talk, we're going to do the women. We might just let the women go to next week, but both she and Daisy Fritz, and Daisy Fritz ran the Ford Farm. You have these incredibly dedicated women, but then around 1960, you got into regulations, and they said to the, said to Mom Wheeler, "Why don't you have a sprinkler system?" Yeah. They go, Duh. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. It loses the whole spirit of it. But the rules start encroaching, and then the poor Farm. Boom, foster homes, right? It's hard to say whether that's progress or not, but you see things that they don't, they have a modern report, a modern view of things. Up until now, uh, I wanted to make, I've been talking about the four key ethnic groups that became, that were here, you know, and it seemed almost a little bit like I needed to prove my point a little bit that only this area, which is Frederick County today, Berkeley County today, Jefferson County today, having the first four original main ethnic groups. It sounds forced, but what I wanted, the point I wanted to make just before we start today, and I'm gonna do a little recap of where we've been, then the Civil War today, is if you were to go all down the Shenandoah Valley and look at the ethnic distribution all the way down, and Pennsylvania, you're gonna get German and Scott-Irish. And then if you go, South of us, they're all a different, you know, German and Scott Irish too. But only those two groups all the way down. But this was was unique, really. I needed to make this point for you know to be clear. This got had four because when Lord Thomas Fairfax moved to, of all places, quote Winchester in 1746, he was here to protect his holdings. And with him, so he puts his, he, he shows up and he gets a lawyer that immediately starts a migration of big landowner, tidewater folks. Uh, and with them, those who are enslaved. Then you have three, four. So there's, and, and the strange thing all through time, as I think I mentioned, the four groups are always, each one is always between 20 and 30% of the total. So you know, if you just stay steady, it's kind of four, four pieces. And when you, know, when you have equality, they have to listen to each other. Right. There's no one dominating. I just wanted to get that up. Okay. I'm just going to say, start off here with a little background. March 14th, we set up, and guess what? Look what I did. I did my homework. March 14th, we set up uh, how the portion of the then Frederick County, that is Jefferson County, was blessed with an extraordinary soil described by one expert, this is Dr. David Stewart, as the best in all of Virginia. The hunting was, and was shooting ducks in a barrel, almost literally. It was scarcely called hunting. This paradise located beyond the reach of much of civil government, west of the Blue Ridge, and the people who gravitated to our county trying to forget memories of famines, religious persecution, and rent gouging and church taxes, obviously had an unquenchable thirst for the good life outside and within. 
So I'm going to refine some of the things that we, I learned more. Okay, we have refined together these waves of four waves of settlers, German speaking Palatines. That's the proper way of putting it, because there was no Germany. Backcountry Irish and Scott Presbyterians mostly, largely land owning Tidewater Anglo American colonists from the upper class families coming from in, I mean, coming from in southern England, who also wanted more land and had not, and had not, and they've been depleting their tobacco, their soil to the east by an excessive cultivation of tobacco. And then the third group, that the fourth group that came with the third group were those who were African Americans freed and some enslaved. This is new information. It goes back to John saying, well, your question, well, I did, okay. In the fall of 1704, hunting parties came down the Elk Branch Creek. This is from the family oral histories of the Engle family in camp near the head spring a few hundred yards from what is now Shenandoah Junction. And there were vast herds of deer, elk, and a lot of other game. So in April 1707, Jacob Engel, the pastor, John Miller, Daniel Miller, John Barron, uh, Giss is a big Maryland name, Longbreak and Hagley decided they would move their families down as it was early in the spring, and they built a number of cabins. Lucky us, 1707, the map, Harper's Ferry. That's the data, the hand-drawn map by uh, Jean uh, François Michel from Switzerland, the explorer. So we, we got 177 to hug is a good, very provable start point. And that we didn't have that here before. Okay, 1719, John, let's call this number two. The Church of the Brethren came into Virginia here. Uh, and they they come from past breaking past ties with the Quaker colony. And of course, 1731, the hustler, <laughs> Joe Yosite. Yosite, a German speaking Palatine and hustle and entrepreneur, sold optical farmland sites from his 144,000 acres on the strict proviso that the settlers establish a family at least in every thousand acres within two years, which is a really good development in Santino into this. And then we, again, just almost done already. 1730 to 1750, huge wave of German Palatines and backcountry Irish Presbyterians Scott, and Scott Presbyterians. And 1775, this is news, the Elk Branch Presbyterian Church, preceding the one we see there now, was built in 1775. And it had a fun, and it was had an installed uh, pastor named John McKnight, Princeton educated, and it functioned from 1775 to 1783. Yes. Is that the church that's over near Duffields? Well, that's, see, thank you. This is the same Elk Branch Church, but that was dated 1830. That little building is 1830. And now some of the people are finding, uh, they're finding across the street, just immediately across the street. The guy who owned it in 1730 is a very committed Presbyterian in part. And one of the cemetery searchers has found steps and he has all the curious depressions of what would be a cemetery. So, but it's the same, but just this is the earlier, earlier building. And oh, so you're saying that the church that you first referenced is actually was actually across the street yeah. there. And the concept <laughs> of an approved uh, uh, church. And if you don't think this is Irish influence, it was called from the Donegal, the Donegal Presbyterian chapter. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, getting my I'm getting the location. So, what you're talking about which Presbyterian church are we talking about? Not the, the little tiny one at Buffields. Yes, I know about that. Cute, cute one. Well, see, the idea that an Elk Branch Presbyterian, Presbyterian pastor precedes that structure on that side. It's just across on the street. That, oh, no, it's across the street. Yeah, and it goes I way back it. to 1775. Yeah. My source is A.D. Kenneman, professor at Shepherd, who, you know, who, who uh, was the editor of the county magazine. So, anyway, that was a new, I keep dropping in new stuff. And as I said, in 1746, Lord Thomas Fairfax decided to throw his weight around and he came uh, to you know, defend his, his uh, properties. 
And it's interesting that our, our young George Washington was hired to survey in order to sue <laughs> after his family acquired a good 8,000 acres of what they wanted. Okay. And then we tied it up by saying, pointing out George Washington in many ways shaped this county because, mere, largely because he established the Harpers Freight Armory here, which attracted the BO in here, which made the Civil War, made this strategically crucial for the Civil War. It goes back to George. So we I tied it off with the railroads. And it's a move from a Edenic paradise to a modern place with that, where you, you, you're governed by time clocks and not the, not the phases of the moon. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna go into the Civil War. I know a lot about it, okay? But we're gonna, be, we're gonna stay on a personal human side. And here we are, look at David. <coughs> David Hunter Strother, that is one of the most interesting divided families that we have. And when he died, the David Hunter Strother died in 1869 or so. Did you know he's born in Martinsburg? His wife was from Shepherd to Charlestown. When he died, did you know he was, they said his name was a household word in New America. And that is because he was a extremely good artist, you know, and, and writer for Harper's New Monthly. He's, he's, he's really an interesting guy. And he was a union man. He was a union man and, and he's related to so many hard fire breathing uh, hunters who were, who were uh, Confederate. But do you know why that's so? If you've traveled and you've been to Europe, and you apprentice with Samuel F. B. Morris, you get a wider perspective on things. The easiest way for people to preserve these like racist biases is just stay home. Okay, here we are. It, the war has begun. It's April morning of April 19th, Harpers Ferry. The night before, there was a big explosion when the, the Union Command literally blew up the arsenal so that Turner Ashby and Imminent and the militia could not get down the hill fast enough and get all the arms. And so as, there, as all these Confederate guys were racing down, they saw a huge glow and a loud noise. And they go, uh, you know, this is Hunter. This is David Hunter Strother surveying, watching the ladies lower the flag, the American flag, and went, you know, maybe just lower it, you know. Here we go. <clears throat> But the more, but the more skillful presently guessed the truth and concluded that the officer in command had set fire to the arsenals and abandoned the town with the ashes the arsenal cooled. I perceived in the light of the next day the enormity of the events. I must confess that I felt this morning like a man wandering in a maze so it seemed that the sudden gust of emotion excited by the lowering of our starry flag had swept away the mists of speculation and revealed in its depth and breadth the abyss of degradation opened by secession. Yesterday, I was a citizen of the great American Republic. My country spanned a continent, her northern border near the frigid zone while her southern limit touched the tropics. Her eastern and western shores were washed by the two great oceans of the globe. Her commerce covering the most remote seas, her flag honored in every land. The strongest nations acknowledged her power and the most enlightened honored her attainments in the art, science, and literature. And her political system, the cherished ideal toward whose realization the noblest aspirations and efforts of mankind have been directed for ages. A great experiment with the pure and wise of all nations are watching with trembling solicitude and imperishable hope. It was something to belong to such a nationality. This was yesterday. Today, who am I? A citizen of Virginia, a petty commonwealth with scarcely a million white inhabitants, 
What could she ever hope to be but a worthless fragment of the broken gods? A fallen splintered column of the once glorious temple. But I will not dwell longer on this humiliating contrast. Come, harness up the buggy and let us get out of this or I shall suffer. April 19, 1861, that appeared in Harper's, June 1866. So now he's a good critic. He's North-South together. He comments on how Northerners perceive very, very mistakenly the nature of their opponent. You know, the New York papers speak of the Southern people as effete. And there seems to be an impression prevailing generally in the North that the physique of the Southern people, he's checked definitely this county, okay, this area. The physique of the Southern people is deteriorated by life of luxurious and dissolute idleness. If adapter idealists, ideal, ideologists who entertain such an idea should happen to come in contact with some hardy, hardy Southern mountaineer carrying a 150 pound buck on his shoulder, some, some stark and sinewy swamper with the swivel of a duck and gun, some hard riding Tony Lumpkin of a rural gentry, a Prue Chevalier of the, of the tournaments, cockfights and quarter races, he would presently find out who was he feet. <laughs> you can just see that guy coming out of the woods with the elephant <laughs> There is probably not a population to be found who by their habits of life, occupation, and amusements are better fitted for soldiers than that of the Southern states. Horses and firearms are their playthings. From childhood, impatient of these restraints of schoolhouses and workshops, they seek life and pleasure in the soil and thus early learn the topography of nature, the ways of the fields and forests, swamps and mountains, their social and political life, but little restrained by law or usage, develops with vigorous individuality. This goes back to our image of the local guys who joined George Washington, same persona. Born, they, they're, they're tough. And they're, I told you what Doug Taylor told me, the black guys. These guys, the army loves these guys. What was that like? They could track even, they could even track an ant. <laughs> and you never forget that line. So let's glance at a man, it's not on here, but there's some of you heard of Turner Ashby. And he's like visually the complete kind of guy he's talking about. He's a great horseman and wins all the way for the tournaments and everything. But what's interesting is the classic case, he was from just over, over the border. But he was the one here invading Arcus Ferry. He looks great, but when you read the details, here we go. This is from uh, William Neese, a man from Middleway who enlisted to fight up, I think it was, it was the 7th Cavalry under, under Ashby. And Stonewall Jackson was always nervous with Ashby, not trained at all militarily, had a huge ego, and his numbers kept getting the first. 50% larger than the average regiment, 100%, 200%. He was just recruiting anybody who came along, and it was just an unwieldy, undisciplined group of guys. He even challenged Stonewall to a duel. This is this is not this is not good stuff. Okay. Now, Nice describes his first impressions of Ashby in the early part of the war. Run superbly with drawn saber flashing in the sunlight and his long beard floating in the wind like wavy silk as he dashed by. He was a striking representation of a princely knight of the Middle Ages, and the sight of sight made me feel a little tightish myself. But then, after he got a little more used to or unused to working under Ashby, we're at April 3rd and 4th. 1862. This is when you're a historian or you're reading, you read something and you have to say, wait a minute, I've got to read it again. What is going on? This is it. He wrote in his diary, and he's, 
I heard Ashby say today that when the Yankees, when the Yankee pickets fire at him, which they sometimes do, he stops and sits in his horse right still without dodging or moving in the least. And he advised that the picket, uh, he said that he has observed that if the pickets think that he's at a long range that they cannot reach, uh, he can stand that way without any fear or danger or being shot because they believe they're beyond his, he's beyond their range. Uh, need I say that in two months he was dead? <laughs> but don't you love that? Perfectly still. Do, everybody should do this perfectly still. Yeah, so it's amusing. Um, and Tatum, we all know, you know, but he stayed in American military history. It was loud here. I, I didn't include all of it, but on Mary Benninger Mitchell and Nancy could really write well. Now she's the one there on page one of the book. I got it. It's on the first page. We won't worry about it. But let's just, Dennis Fry's father said one of the best civilian accounts of the Civil War, it's in Battles and Leaders, Volume 2, A Woman's Recollections of Antietam. And we are very fortunate that she's talking about Shepherdston for 10 small type pages. And I've fortunately been able to figure out what is where, but when Dansky, Caroline Bettinger, Caroline Benninger is her real name, and her daughter, sister's name is Mary Benninger, the daughters of Congressman Henry Benninger, who had died in 1858. They both wrote something about Antietam. But it was Mary who wrote, it see, as I told you, it seems to me now that the roar of that day began with a light in Shepherdstown, and all through its long and dragging hours, its thunder formed background to our pain and terror. And she's they described Jackson's men a few days earlier marching through town, hurrying to get to Harper Street to capture it. And she said, remember our, 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 our anemic vocabularies today? Men rose up out of the ground like lean, dusty, tattered amalians. <laughs> tattered amalians. <laughs> oh, I used that yesterday. And, you know, and they so, she said they were gone, starvation, you know, the gone starvation that. Uh, you saw them the look of their eyes. The kids are running to and fro, you know, and the girls are bringing soup, the girls are bringing bandages, learning how, describing nursing, probably 7,000 wounded in town. Let's talk about sound. David Hunter Strother, our buddy, was at Pry House where McClellan was and observing the battle. Isn't it interesting? that he had the morning battle to see, you know, this, you know, Cornfield and McConnell, and here's the midday. Interesting point. If you have a guy, if, you, if another guy, oh no, if you have a telescope like, like this, and you have an opinion, you give what you think should happen to this man, and he gets on his horse, and 15 minutes later, he gets over there, and he tells him what, McClellan saw on his telescope years, maybe like 15 minutes ago, it's not going to work. But just remember that he had, he had on the morning, they really, Strauss said, he really couldn't see anything in, in the fall of fighting because it was so smoky. He had no way of knowing what was going on. So it wasn't a big success, it was just a slaughter. Sunk in the midday, sunk in lane, and a Confederate artilleryman uh, named Edwin Porter Alexander was, was on the other side. He said later, the end of the Confederacy was in sight. He said, Lee actually made a mistake. He has a back to his river. And he's basically saying the fact that McClellan couldn't finish the battle, finish him off, is, is a disgrace. This is, anyway, but it was, he could see everything. And they fought well, and they planned well. But the sound. Strother said, it sounded like Niagara Falls. 
Alpheus Williams. Oh, okay. When, when General Hood, like 7.30 in the morning on the, of that day, you know, the very beginning of the fighting on the, in the, on the cornfield, his men were having their first hot food in days, and they're just, and Stonefield, Stonewall says, go. You know, and they, they carefully put down their food, and they were, they said it was like a, a hornet's nest. Which is so, you know, they, I didn't care what happened. This is the people who charged across the field, came right to the edge of the line of the art, of Pennsylvania t artillery at the morning battle. And like 36 guns were fired. And the casualties of the, I think it's the 82nd te Texas uh, Regiment, were the highest of any regiment in the Civil War 82%. As they ran across, they said it sounded like a thousand bugles. That's that Reveille Elf thing. Sound again. This is the one that's eerie. You're getting the idea of artillery. General Alpheus Williams is a New Yorker. And he said how the artillery founded a base, provided a base to that infernal music. He said, if all the buildings on Lower Broadway should come tumbling to the ground, the sound would not have been louder. That was so 9-11 so in my mind. But that's, you know, okay, so you got the sound. I'm gonna say that this is a poem, uh, those who know the poetry, Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes was the poet laureate of England. And he wrote these very, they weren't pretty little poems, you know, they're kind of really bare and, and, and he was very inspired by William Butler Yeats, but he really kind of deep into the mythology. And everything. Okay, I actually heard him speak personally in college and I was very, very grateful. In 1967, he said, the, Brit the English, the English are like dead fish. <laughs> and you're English, shut up. No, but he, here's what he said. He wrote a poem for a book called Crow. And this is gonna, I'm just gonna read part of it. It'll, it'll tip you over, it's Antietam. Crow's account of the battle. <clears throat> there was this terrific noise. There was this terrific battle. The noise was as much as the limits of possible noise could take. There were screams higher, groans deeper than any ear could fold. Many eardrums burst, and some walls collapsed to escape the noise. What an image. Everything struggled on its way through this tearing deafness as through a torrent in a dark cave. The fingers, the cartridges were banging off as planned. The fingers were keeping things going according to excitement and orders. The unheard eyes were full of deadliness till the explosives ran out and sheer weariness supervened and what was left looked around. That's Antietam. And what was left looked around and left at what was left. He's an Antietam, we're in the burial. <sighs> then everybody wept or sat too exhausted to weep. And when the smoke cleared, it became clear this had happened too often before. It was going to happen too often in the future and happen too easily. Bones were too like lath and twigs. Blood was too much like water. Cries were too like silence. And shooting somebody through the midriff was too like striking a match. Too like potting a slip of ball. To like tearing up a bill and blasting the whole world to bits was too like slamming a door. Too like root dropping in a chair, saucy with rage. So the survivors stayed, and the earth and the sky stayed. Everything took the blame, not a leaf flinched, and nobody smiled. To me, to me, that's one of the, the damnedest great poems about combat you'll ever read. It's scary. I didn't even tell you all of it. 
According to universal laws, crowd mom, mama, mouths cried mama. So that brings it home. And again, the great irony is that was needed. Lincoln, as we said, he needed, he needed a vent on a battlefield to issue an executive order uh, abolishing slavery in wartime. So if we fast forward to one of my favorites, this is, this is Mary Clemmer Ames. I, mean, I, I think she's so cool. She, after the war, uh, I think you like her, Sheila. She, she was the highest paid journalist woman. No, I mean the highest paid, but she was the number one woman uh, journalist in America. And she was, she lived in DC and, and, and really could write well. So she finds herself in Harper's Ferry in November 62, and all the, all the armies have left, and they're left with the ones who can't leave. And she's getting exposed to all the realities of that. And we all know Harper's Ferry. You know where the little Lutheran church is? You go down, it's, it's in the old, it's there in the Civil War. You, you drive down and let's see, here's the post office. And then there's a few buildings, and then there's a very modest little brick church on the left as you're going down towards the town. That's the Lutheran church that she was in. And there's a Library of Congress photograph with all the Union soldiers lined up on Fillmore Street in the distance. There's the church. I'm, I'm giving you two pretty heavy ones, and then we'll move past. But you know, when somebody can write, she had the task. It's like somebody's got to do it. She has the task of figuring out how to inform the family in writing. And she is in the church. I'm not sure how many people were even alive, but she had to go through knapsacks and pull out something that was proper to send to the mother. You know, what a profound, but thank God somebody could write what it was like. I looked up from the contents of the knapsack, which had moved me so much. And for the first time, I realized the appalling loneliness of my surroundings. There were the high walls of the vestibule, all torn with bombshells, its dark open closets, its wide floor piled high with old knapsacks and haversacks. I, sitting in the midst of them on a box with no light, but that given by the one tallow candle at my side, which threw its feeble and flickering rays over the, <laughs> the open bags and their contents. I go to these and open them, take out every treasure they contain, and with a letter send them to the friends of the boy who owned them. A little drummer boy died yesterday. I had found his haversack. It contained a picture of himself taken with his mother when he enlisted. Such a rosy boy. I thought as I looked upon him yesterday, wasted and dead, that I was glad that his mother could never know how he changed before he died. I have sent his last message and all his things to the boys who own them will never go back. To one unfamiliar with the soldier's life, these relics might mean little. <laughs> to me, they mean all love, all suffering, all heroism. Deeds of valor are no longer dreams gone by. We live in nightly days. Our men are dauntless men. Will there ever be one to write the life of the common soldier? His blood buys us all that we hold dear, county home, a free government, endless pri privileges of a free people. Okay. Wonderful person. We're now, of course, see, I'm talking from a local perspective. You go, go into 1863, and the whole issue of getting Jefferson Party County part of the new state of West Virginia is the main focus of the spring of 63. And 
just know by the end of 63, the, 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 uh, the union controls the cap. Usually they always control Harper's Ferry, but they control it from that point on. In the summer, okay, okay, let's see if you clear this. They had the election. Uh, there, was a, there was a referendum here in May of 63, and a teeny tiny handful of people could vote because you had to give the loyalty of it. And the vast majority of everybody who were Confederate weren't there anyway. It was, it was very, just, it was legalistically accurate. And they got a vote under those conditions. They got enough votes saying that Jefferson County voted to join the state of West Virginia. It's a tiny hand, 130 votes. Now, it was disputed after the war. You know, some local ex Confederates appealed it, said it was, it was fixed, it wasn't accurate. It went to the Supreme Court twice. But what they said finally was, after this little vote was taken, the official letter that was sent to the new governor of West Virginia said, you know, this, this is good. And, and, and they have to say it, it, was, it was approved by a substantial majority. So the governor puts a signature on the authorizing thing that says that the vote was, it was, it was accurate and by a substantial majority. No, it's not true. But okay, what is a wartime election going to be anyway? It's all kind of hoped up anyway. Um, and that's how we became West Virginia. And for decades, little old ladies in Charlestown would always put the Charlestown B.A. So here we go. This is the closest we get to home. We've, we've gone around to the summer of 1864. Certainly we could talk about, we'll talk about the rest later. The union runs the county. And I, know, I think Paul knows all this stuff from, from the night of the black box. That was very excellent, the night of the black box. Okay. Programming did. All right, good. This is, and once again, utterly, utterly, un, nobody knows about Bedford, Paul. You dig into the history. It's like, mm -hmm. Truly, we're, we're closing in on, we're closing in on this. Here's Mary Clever Ames. This comes a little later. Well, I'll just say this incidentally. This, this image here is about Jan, Jasper Thompson. He grew up, yeah, chronologically, this is, this is October, uh, July 30th, 1864, okay? And so just a couple of weeks later comes what I'm gonna tell you next. I mentioned him here because he was born on, uh, well, it's his family of many generations farmed for the Washingtons. They have all the Bible and everything. And Jasper was a little boy, and then uh, you know, I've got all that. I did a whole big video about it. And but he he became a, a, a sergeant, which means he's a good leader in the U.S. Colored Troops 23rd, and he was at the car at the crater. And the crater is very good. You know, there was four divisions. One of them was all white guys, and one was black. And he was in the division that was black. About two nights before the battle, his, he had a really good general, General Thomas. Thomas and he said, I've been instructed that you are going to lead with the charge. You're going to be in front. And all the black guys, this, this remember we talk about creativity and music? It's a wonderful book. I got so lucky finding this. The general even included a melody line of what they did. They were happy. And, and what, this is a remember I told like studying. They just told they were going to leave the battle, and they were, and they're like this, really happy. And and this one guy starts singing a tune. We you march into war. We march into war like that. Those are the words. And then first time no one took it. No, it didn't take. Works it. He reworks it and starts again. Little different tune, a little different cadence, and then someone else adds. And then three, four, five, he got it right. And then someone else adds this adding, editing to the group. And, you know, he said the whole regiment was singing. The whole regiment. This is how in black culture you improv, you know. And then we got word that 
Burnside heard they were going to tear Susa down. And that was rescinded. And General Thomas said they never sang. And they went out, and, and the 23rd Regiment, Jaspers, had the most casualties of any regiment in white or black. So they just probably. Were they the ones laying the charges? Well, they helped. Underground, were they? That's, well, it hit, our, the black guys were very involved. In any, the engineering feat of that tunnel and the explosion is a story in itself. And it yeah. blew, blew it up under them. It's massive. In a long hidden tunnel, they worked for Yeah. That was that's a great story, but that they helped on that, and then they were given the combat role. So uh, that's the story there. So Lee Wolf Park Jasper recovering from a crater. And the crater uh, is at Antinum. I, I'm sorry. Petersburg. What? Yeah, Petersburg. I should. I'm sorry. That was that was a big siege area, like the middle of the city. was fighting forever around Petersburg. That's where the tunnel is in Petersburg. Yes. Yeah. Right. And give you a little I'm hint. Sorry, what movie is that? Is that uh, I don't. No, I that's don't another. I know, I know what you mean. I'm trying to remember the name of the movie. Uh, I've just been there. Renee Zellweger was in the movie. Oh, Cold Mountain. It's in Cold Mountain. Uh, Cold Mountain. Yeah, that's right. And, and if you look at my video, I I grab some quick stills of the cop. Yeah. I think it just a, you know, but uh, the, I mean, but it failed visibly. It did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. And they were yeah. slaughtered despite yeah. huge efforts. And they, well, they got they ended they up in the crater, and got trapped. Yeah, yeah. They were that's exactly what happened. happened. They like shooting pigeons in the barrel. And do you know where the commander of that division was of the black? He's back here getting drunk. And guess what? He's the same guy who was at the uh, Antietam when they crossed the creek. He was famous for having a drinking problem. And Ferraro, he said he had no one could get across that. We're doing anti, I'm sorry, flashback, park over here. We're going forward, but I gotta say, Ferraro was not, let's say he's not leading. He, he, he just being another guy, you know. But it's, I, I want to hear a twist. Nobody is Ferraro back in Antietam. Nobody can get any Union troops across the river, the Antietam Creek, against these sharpshooters mm -hmm. on a hillside. <laughs> but that, and none of them could, but then for us, says, look, that's New York 69th. And for us, like a, a ballet school dancer, isn't that funny? In New York, but he said, look, you guys, if you can get across, you get your drinking privileges back. And they just, wham, they took it, you know? That's reality, you know? But he knew his men. But then, you know, sometimes it cuts different ways. Um, now we're back to our, our county. It's quiet. Everybody who was, was black could have gone, and they did. But each many places, there was like a woman who was close to the household. In this case, it was Margaret Bumpkins at, at Fountain Rock, Peggy Washington at, uh, at, at, at these two homes in Shepherdstown. And that was the condition, quiet and kind of sad. They've seen so many things, 130 war events. David Dennis Fry calls it 1,300 days of strike. So this is what happens. Nikki Butler and Henrietta Butler, neighbors. Tippy lives in a house which, which is where the pavilion of, the Mor of Morgan's Grove is. And, uh, okay, here we go. Here we go. In the, this is David Hunter Strawler. In the, oh, here we go. In the summer of 1864, 15,000 federal soldiers entered the Valley of Virginia. The commanding general was one David Hunter, not to be confused with David Hunter Strawler. This one burned down BMI. He ordered the burning of three homes in Jefferson County, including Alexander R. Boatler's, at that time a member of the Confederate Congress at Richmond, the footprint of his home, Fountain Rock, in its own, own picture, is where the pavilion and much ground surrounding at Morgan's Grove Park stand. Now we're going to go back in time. Recalled by Elizabeth Stockton Pendleton, it's from a 1930 Shepherdstown Register. 
from the recollections of her mother, Tippy Bowen. I, I seem to be with a little group of group at Fountain Rock in that day in July. My mother, my widowed Aunt Elizabeth, with her little three children, and Margaret Bunkin, the only servant left upon the place. I can see my frail, white-faced aunt looking like death after a severe illness, just creeping about the house. It is easy to recognize my mother in the vigorous, cheerful, charming young girl who has looked after her sister's comfort, minded the babies, cooked the dinner, and at last goes wearily up to her room for a moment's rest. It is all as if I had been there in spirit, the oppressive stillness of the midsummer afternoon, the loneliness of the place, the voice of the Negro woman singing in the laundry room of the spring house, coming faintly up through the lilac hedge to the upper chamber. The slight, dark-eyed girl brushing out her auburn hair, that's for Tibby, preparatory to her nap. Then the appearance of my aunt at the door with her startled whisper. Don't undress. Come with me. A party of Yankees is here. We went down and were met at the, end, at the end of the front porch by a small band of cavalrymen gathered before the house. The captain, his name was Captain Martindale. He later, after the war, he, he took poison. He took arsenic. He said he took it with intent of suicide. The captain dismounted and came forward, handing a paper. Without a word, the two sisters read it together. <clears throat> you are ordered to proceed to the houses of A.R. Butler and E.J. Lee to burn everything under, the co under cover on both places with their contents. The order was addressed Captain Martindale, the first New York Cavalry and signed David Hunter, Major General USA. As the sisters realized the meaning of the words and the order to burn their beloved home, everything grew black before Helen's eyes until her sister's voice, I love this, recalled to her his senses, don't give way. If you give way, you cannot act. And they immediately separated to say what they could. The mother flew to her children and sent them home Sent them, at, sent them at once with Margaret Bunkin's uh, child, Kitty, a capable young girl, to a safe place under the oaks at some distance, probably like where the playground is. The little one started off hand in hand, six-year-old Fanny with her new flowered hat and her nice dress, night dress under her arm, with four-year-old Alexander clinging, and the baby in the nurse's arms. By this time, the soldiers were scattering all over the place, and mother ran straight up to the garret, followed by several men and nerved by grief and excitement, pulled an immense box of linen to the top of the stairs. The box itself empty could with difficulty be moved by one person. Tippy asked some of the soldiers to carry it down and they did so in a kind, dazed confusion of purpose. One man followed her everywhere, trying to help and do everything she asked. Others were only intent on securing things for themselves. This house had paintings of Charles Wilson Peale. He's the direct descendant of Charles Wilson Peale. We're in that. We lost them. Sometimes the soldiers would take up an article. Let that alone would come the order. That's tippy. And they would hurriedly turn to something else. Going to the pantry, mother found Captain Martindale looking curiously around. Please, please put the china here, she said to him holding up her skirt by the hem as to make, make a kind of bag, he obediently piled in piece after piece of beautiful new flower dinner set and other favorite piece, pieces. Why, girl? He said at last, poke here in the belt with his forefinger. Your dress will get way soon there, see? Never mind my dress, but just do as I say, she answered. And he put it, put it in with the rest of the china in the midst of the hurry and confusion, it was amazing to see one of the men vainly trying to fasten a big Sheffield uh, uh, waiter to his saddle. He turned it in every possible way, but the thing was much too large, and he adjusted to the situation. At last, she just threw it down, you know. 
another oak. Another soldier was found in a bedroom trying on a suit of David Shepherds. He's the deceased husband of Elizabeth, sister. Uh, and he tries on a uniform of David Shepherds and, and Tibby says, take those off. You may burn them, but you shall not wear them. Certainly, certainly, certainly. A quiet young man came up to mother with a small photograph on porcelain of Murillo's Immaculate Conception. And he said, I'm a Christian, crossing himself, and I cannot let this be burned. He was responsible for the preservation of an old steel engraving, the picture of the interior of the Capuchin Monastery uh, with the monks at their devotions. Aunt Elizabeth saved grandfather's Stockton's pictures and some other oil port portraits and a few things for the children and bundles of father's paper, but the soldiers threw the, her baby's cradle back into the flames, and one of them kicked a hole in the toilet pitcher she had carried down the stairs. The soldier's task of firing was soon accomplished. The chairs were piled in the, in the center of the, of the rooms. Some combustible fu fluid poured over them, and the men ran about from place to place and lit brooms and setting them ablaze. The library building containing thousands of volumes and many valuable papers and autograph letters and curios were set on fire last. Aunt Hannah's cottage and the two smaller cabins where the family servants lived were also entirely destroyed. Finally, everyone was forced to leave the burning building and in a sudden uncontrollable pulse of passionate grief, my mother rushed back into the parlor and touching the keys of the beloved piano with a last farewell in her own. My young mother sang the stanzas of Char Charlotte Elliott's beautiful hymn. Some people say she played Dixie. That's not what you sing in your house today, Adele. This is called a famous song called Thy Will Be Done. My God, my Father, while I stray far from my home in life's rough way, oh, teach me for my heart to say that I will die. And though dark my path, goes, oh, though dark my path and sad my lot, let me still sit and burn on, or breathe a prayer divinely tall, thy will be done. And there's more, and then she says, then when on earth I Breathe no more, the prayer oft mixed with tears before. I'll sing upon a happier shore, and I will be done. One of the soldiers seized her by the shoulder and tried to lead her away into safety, but she pulled him away and sang again, if thou should call me to resign, what I prize most near was mine. I only yield thee what is thine, thy will be done. But with her music books and guitar, she quickly joined the battle, they joined the uh, little group outside watching the final work of the fire. And they always describe how the, uh, they had a balcony, you see it on the picture. There's roses and the, the flames, you could see the roses kind of wilting in the intense heat. How often in the vivid story of this wartime tragedy have we pictured the scene, the cluster of white roses hanging over the porch and as they were caught one by one in the climbing flames and sent whirling upward, shriveled and broken, the trembling black tracery of the window shutters outlined against the red flame within and the sound of the clanging piano strings through the roar of the fire as they snapped in the melting heat. Almost a short trot jog away is Bedford, this is the next house. Bedford, a red brick mansion built on a, on a knoll. Actually, ironically, it's where, where Morgan's, Morgan School is, that was private school is. That was an outbuilding they built on. And it faced south. Bedford, a red brick residence built on a knoll, had a two-story two central portico flanked by rambling wings, a lofty front portico with a soaring pointed roof was supported by four huge white wooden columns. You know who built this? Daniel Bettinger, our friend Daniel Bettinger, who was such a remarkable person in the revolution. Okay, 
and he became the head of Norfolk Navy Yard. And for that reason, uh, the battle, splintered battle scarred mast of the US frigate the Constitution had been used to be part of the columns in the front of the house. Jim, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Um, these two instances, I got confused as to who was doing what to who. Um, the, these, first of all, uh, only the women were home. The men were off there was fighting. No men. They were off somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and their rationale was, uh, you know, Bowler was the Bowler designed the Confederate seal. <laughs> so, and then, and then, of course, Edmund Jennings Lee was the first cousin of Robert. So that was the reason in, in Hunter's mind for doing this. Okay. So these yeah. were, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the the buildings were burnt by the. The union. Yeah, yeah. And I, see, I'm not trying to play size or anything, but it's just a good story. And can you imagine my 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 amazement when Martin Martindale he was haunted by this? And sure enough, I found an old soldier from California, William F. Martindale, death by an arsenic with intent to suicide. And I think it haunted him. He was union. He was yeah. He was the local guy who ordered to do everything. Now you need to know Lincoln forbade burning homes after that. But in this, they really got there was a real price for that. Like 500 homes in Chambersburg. I, I call it a calculus of war. You burn three in Jefferson County, and then Jubal Early, since it's not in here, I'll say Jubal Early says Henrietta Benninger sends him a I mean, I'm gonna hit describe briefly. Henrietta Bettinger's account of her home burning, she writes a, a union man who's an uncle, a relative. But the trouble, yeah. the problem is she writes a letter that I often call a, a masterpiece of sublime invective to General Hunter. And a letter that goes, General Hunter, yesterday your, cap, your underling captain warned that Martha burned my house. If your letter starts there, where do you go? It's going to be very downhill. <laughs> And, and, and you know, it's it isn't going to be good. And I'm almost paraphrasing it. It's almost a little bit too long. Henry had a massive ego, you know, but she's very, all the Benningers could write. I think you're figuring that out. At the very end, she says, General Hunter, if anyone could lift your name, the angels would thrust the foul thing out and the demons take their own. And my joke is, uh, Sincerely, have you been injured? No, have a nice day. <laughs> Once again, we don't know how to write. Where, where was we going? Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Think, you know, thinking of you. No, she, she, I like to say that you like Tippy, you know, I'll tell you one. But Henrietta was a lioness. <laughs> okay. In less than a half hour from the time the soldiers started the work of destruction on, on, uh, Fountain Rock, the company was filing down the avenue on its way to bed for the home of Eve Edmund Jennings Lee. And just as the whole soldiers started off, Virginia Bettinger and her little brother, Harry, who lived nearby at Papa, Papa Road, that's the relatives of Dansky and Mary Bettinger, arrived at F Fountain Rock, arrived at, well, they went to Fountain Rock and then people said, go back to your home, Aunt Henrietta, they're coming there next. And then Cap Martindale confronts Henrietta Benninger Lee. What she does is write a relative in August. My dear friend, the morning of that evening was calm and lovely. No one dreaming that such dire calamity and mischief was near. I with Netta, her daughter, my young daughter and my little son were all in the members and all the members of the house of the family were at home. At about four o'clock in the afternoon, Harry rushed into my sick room saying, Oh, mama, the Yankees have burned Colonel Boatler's house. At this startling intelligence, I immediately rose and dressed. In a few moments, the enemy was upon us. I met the captain on the portico when the following conversation took place. Is this Mrs. Lee? The captain asked. Yes. Well, I have come to burn your house, he said coolly, by order of General Hunter. Here, read the order. Handing it at the same time a printed order, to burn the house, its contents in all of our outbuildings, signed by General David Hunter. And now remember everything about Daniel Bettinger Lucas. This is his Bedford Bettinger. He built it. Yeah, this is his home home. Surely, she said, you will not, 
cannot execute such a barbarous infamous order. Do spare this house. It was built by my father, the revolutionary soldier and officer. Oh, have respect for his memory and his deeds. I implore you, do not burn his home. She grew up there, an honorable home. Martinsburg, Martin, <laughs> it's like Martindale's reply was in those coarse and unfeeling tones. Lord and woman, you must be a fool. Can I help it? You're old enough to know that. And now I give you 10 minutes to take out your, out your clothing. She says, ah, I saw from his cold, cruel eyes that from that iron hardness of his face, there was no more for me. And that for farther appeal was useless. What could I do? My mind was too distracted to guide me. So many memories round my childhood's precious home. I left him and tried to collect some necessary articles as I passed my pantry door. Martindale stepped in and seized a decanter, which doubtless he thought contained brandy, which proved to be blackberry wine. Oh, how I wish I had drugged it with Ipecac. <laughs> I think, his, I think this noble captain would have been sick of that day's work. Yeah. <laughs> they had the epic back then? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's the word they used. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So that's an old, old, old. I hadn't realized the whole far back in history. No. Yeah, yeah. The tones of very strange country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping I'd make, make him sick of the day's work. But don't suppose I didn't include all his men in his heartless deeds. No, indeed, for some of the soldiers were far more merciful and noble than their leader. And after the house was in full blaze, he turned to my niece, Virginia Benninger, and said in the most insolent and scoffing tone, now go in and help yourself. Mm -hmm. Nothing in nature could not have been more hard and cruel than that man's full bearing. Do these women have any guns in their house? No. No, they just have guns. But I, I, this is, this, no, they, well, I think they're in shock. They're in shock. But this is what I think is, I love. We've learned since we were five to know when you got, got to get out of some place. There's nothing more to be said between him and the other family could be. But you know how you want to, uh, I wish I said that better. You know, you start to reflect on it's cold as, no, I, bet I need to go back and fix that. I, I was too hard. And I'm going to, I'm saying true to facts, but it goes sort of like this. Uh, you can just see it. Really. This is Lee. Uh, I, I uh, just want to offer you uh, my apology and uh, offer you my condolences. <coughs> and she goes, You offer me pity. I scorn. Which is what we would do. <laughs> and, and, and of course, he's starting to go, <laughs> Well, I made a mistake. And he fades away quite properly. <laughs> you get the hell out of there, Jack. And this is what he wished never happened. As I said, they can write. That's when she wrote, Oh, yeah, here's what she said I scorn your pity, I cried. You talk of pity after such an act of this. It is a mockery indeed. The qualities of mercy and pity are strangers to your heart. Okay, okay. I get it, I get it. But my home, my blessed, lovely home, the fire ran from base to dome, and as all the devouring pitiless flames snapped each wire, the bell of that dear home told its dirge. Did they ever write? So, this is when she wrote the letter, which I call the sublime invective. And the problem is for the Union is that General Early is just right down the road in Martinsburg with a lot of men. And he got the letter. And he said, oh, I'm going to avenge the atrocities. He decided he was going to get compensation literally by holding up uh, under threat of conflagration uh, four towns. And giving it to rebuild the houses as his own plans, you know. That's why he went to England when the war ended. So she writes the letters I said, and I'll just kick, kick off some key ones. But this got in the hand early. He goes to Chambersburg and says, You've got a certain amount of time to give me, I think it's two hundred thousand dollars in gold, or I'm gonna burn your town. He can burn 576 
But she said, yesterday under Link, Captain Martindale of the First New York Cavalry executed your infamous order and burned my house. Hyena life would have torn my heart to pieces. No prayer can be offered for you. It's much longer. I'm just were it possible for human lips to raise your name heavenward, angels would thrust the foul thing out and the demons claim their own. Again, I demand, why have you burned my body? Okay. The war is over. Everything's over. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say what happened at Fountain Rock in retrospect to kids later on. And then we're going to go back to Charlestown in uh, the summer of 65. We had a wonderful account of that. Okay, then we're done. But let's stick with the family, the little girls, who obviously this fountain rock is now a big, fantastic ruin. If you've ever seen this, one of the greatest photos, great photo of the whole scarred building. And there's all these little people like chess pieces on the lawn, and one man sitting on this wonderful photograph. But it, it stayed in their dream. So let's finish the memory of, of this and then get back to time period. To, uh, Charlestown, summer 65. Elizabeth Stockton Pendleton, the daughter of Tippies, remembered growing up in the shadow of Fountain Rock and its legends. The old place, like 1880, was by this time an overground ruin, ruin exceedingly picturesque and interesting surrounded by a hedge of orange, so high as to shut out all but the tops of the trees from the view of passers-by. Down at Fountain Rock, we learned to know songbirds intimately and well. Down at Fountain Rock, we built dams in the stream and often followed its course to distant sun-warm pools where we could wade with eight, without eight feet. Down at Fountain Rock, we we tried to realize a home of ideal loveliness where a little girl whom we knew intimately named Helen Bowler moved in a continual round festivity of interesting happenings. For how Fountain Rock, as it has been before and during the war, was the scene of almost every story told us by our mother, whose memory held dear every nook and corner of her childhood's home. It is no wonder but the very name for us had magic. So when you visit Morgan's Grove, you're gonna have all of these memories and thoughts. The story that thrilled us more than any other is that of the burning of the house. And it was a story often asked for by the young friends who visited the home. The story did not always come readily, but soon mother, you know how this is, soon mother would be in the midst of the narrative we wanted. You know how it is. Come on, come on. Remember this, remember that one? I wish I could in some way suggest the vivid realism of the story. Think of, think of Tippy. Her soft, splendid, dark eyes, you can see it in the picture, did half the talking for her. Her wonderful voice added special meaning to every word and the remarkable half unconscious power of mimicry made every character mentioned a real possibility to us. So real indeed. The memory comes back to me as if I had heard and felt it by myself. Fountain Rock has passed in other hands, and the plow has passed over its pleasant places. But there is life in the old land. Okay. We want to go to John Trowbridge. Hi. Where are you, John? No, it's that would be for that. Okay, we'll do it. This is a great place to end the I, I don't have to put an image on you. John Trowbridge was a northern writer, and they all come coming down to report an account. But you're in you're He's, he comes all through the area, Antietam, Harper's Ferry, you know, has a waiter who tells him that he came south when uh, uh, an owner put a gun to his head. But 
Okay, here he is arriving in, arriving in, uh, give me a second here. He starts in Harpers Ferry, quick. okay. John Trowbridge is arriving summer 65, he gets the train to Harpers Ferry, I'll give some comments, and then he takes the train up to Charles. It's so vivid, it's so vivid. And who is he? John Trowbridge, you can Google him, but he's, it's, he's yeah, a, he was a writer. Writer? writer, yeah. Writer. Okay. But this is one of the first ones I could never forget. You're in Harper's Ferry, summer 65. He says, at evening, you sit watching the sunset colors fade into the softened gray and dusky brown tints of the cliffs to deepen into darkness. And the moon comes out and, and sil silvers them. But war has changed all. Freshets tear down the center of the streets, and the dreary hillsides present only ragged groves of weeds. The town itself lies half in ruins. The government works were duly destroyed by the rebels. You see little more than but the burnout empty shells of the bridge across the Shenandoah. Only the ruined piers are left. Still, less remains of the old bridge over the Potomac. And all about the town are rubbish and filth and stench, almost alone of the government buildings. John Brown's engine house has escaped destruction. Oh, interesting. And takes the train. He gets on a train, and this is he's just, it takes an hour to get from Harper Street to Charlotte. <laughs> and but what he does is you have this wonderful tableau of like every dog, cat. A uh, landowner, uh, freedmen, all side by side. It's like, oh man, this is great. Glad no one has a gun, you know? I had a, oh yeah, let's go to that. One morning, I took the train up the valley to Charlestown, this from Charlestown, eight miles. The road, railroad was still in the hands of the government. That's why there's no trouble. There were military guards on the platform and about an equal mixture of loyalists and rebels within the cars. Get this image. Furloughed soldiers returning to the regiments of Winchester or Staunton occupied seats with Confederate officers just out of their uniforms. The strong, dark, defiant, shelf certified face of typical second rate chivalry and the good natured, I love this, the good natured, yeah, really, shrewd, inquisitive physio physiognomy of a, of a Yankee speculator. Not sure about that good natured, but anyway. But they're all sitting, okay, the Yankee speculators going to look at Southern lands were to be, and they're all sitting side by side in curious contrast. There also rode the well-dressed wealthy planter who had been to Washington to solicit, par solicit pardons for his treasonable acts. Uh, that would have been Bush over Washington. And the humble freedman returning from home from which he had been driven by violence when the war closed and left the prey. Mothers, and daughters of the first families of Virginia sat serene and uncomplaining in the atmosphere of mothers and daughters of the black race, late their slaves or their neighbors, but now citizens like themselves, free to come and go. And as clearly entitled to places in the government train as the proudest dames of the land, we pass through the region, the country stamped all over by the devastating hail of war for miles not a fence or cultivated field was visible. At the end of the hour's long drive, we arrived at Charlestown, chiefly interesting to me as a place of John Brown's martyrdom. We alighted from the train, and this train was just behind the county courthouse back in there's there a train line. We alighted from the train at the edge of the, of the boundless unfenced fields into whose melancholy solitudes the desolate streets emptied themselves rivers to that ocean of weeds. On the steps of a boarding house, I found an acquaintance whose countenance gleamed with pleasure at sight. And now you have, there could not be a greater difference between Shepherdstown and Charleston. As he said, at sight, he said, not a single loyal face in that nest of secession, his friend says. He had been there two or three days in a place waiting for luggage which had been miscarried. They're all rebels here, all rebels. He exclaimed as he took his place 
and he, and he walked to me. They're pitiably, pitiably, pitiably poverty stricken said, there is no money in the place and scarcely anything to eat. The war feeling here is like a burning bush with a wet blanket wrapped around it and look from any side, the fire seems quenched. But just peep under the blanket. And there it is, all alive, eating, eating, eating in. The wet blanket is the present government policy. And every act of conciliation shown the rebels is just letting in so much air to feed, feed the fire. So Trovich walks on. A short, you can always picture this. A short walk into the center of the town took us to the scene of John Brown's trial. It was a ruin abandoned to rats and toads. Four massive white brick pillars still standing supported a riddled roof through which God's blue acre, blue sky and gracious sunshine smiled. The main portion of the building had been literally torn to pieces. Floorless, rank weeds were growing. Names of Union soldiers were scrawled along the walls and hilarious soldier boys ripped up the floors and pulled down laths and joists to the tune of John Brown. Uh, this is my favorite, <laughs> this is my favorite part. People pass on the sidewalk, daughters and sons of beauty, a lot of old families, for they were mostly a fine looking spirited class, one of whom had a question which I put to him, stopped quite willingly and talked with us. I have seldom seen a handsomer young face, a steadier eye, and more decided poise and aplomb. Neither have I ever seen the outward garment of courtesy so plumply filled out with the spirit of arrogance. His brief reply is spoken with a pleasant countenance, yet with a short, sharp, downward inflection. We're like pistol shots. Very evidently, the death of John Brown. The war that came swooping down in the old man's path to avenge him and to accomplish the work wherein he failed were not pleasing subjects to this young Southern boy. And no wonder his coat had empty sleep. The arm which should have been there had been lost fighting against his country. His almost savage answers did not move me. But all the while, I looked with compassion at his fine young face in that pendant like sleeve. He had fought against his country. His country had won. And he was those, this is so accurate, and he was of those who had lost and not, not arms and legs only, but all they had been madly fighting for and more, prosperity, prestige, power, his beautiful South his devastate, was devastated and her soil drenched with the best blood of her young men, whether regarded as a crime or a virtue, the folly of making war upon the mighty, mighty North was now demonstrated and the despised Yankees had proved the conquerors of the chivalry of the South. Well, may your thoughts be bitter, my heart said. As I thanked him, see for his information, and to my surprise, he appeared mollified, his answers losing their explosive quality and sharp doubt and with inflections. We're almost done. So we want to find out where John Brown was hanged. It's all covered with weeds. What is it? We engaged a bright young colored girl to guide us to the spot where John Brown's gallows stood. The owner of that land, it was called Hunter's Field. Well, that was a relative of David Hunter's daughter. Now, this is a divided family. Okay, so she got us to where John Brown's gallows stood. She led us into the wilderness of, uh, wilderness of weeds, waist high to her as she tramped on, parting it, you know, through with her hands. And this is about where it was said the girl, and after searching some time among the tall weeds, nobody knows just where the gallows stood. There's a tree here, but that has been cut down and carried away, a stump and roots and all, by folks that wanted something to remember John Brown by. Every soldier took a piece of it. It was only, even if it was only a little chip, and I stood long on that spot, 
the girl pointed out to us and then gracefully drew me rolling her eyes. And looked at the same sky old John Brown looked upon the same groves and just simply wish. And when John Brown was on the way on to his hanging, he did look up and see the gap, the gap in Harper's Ferry. And he said, my God, what a beautiful country. I'll simply summarize by saying, okay, the very last one. This is Jasper. In August 1906, W.B. Du Bois and the NAACP met for the first time on American soil at Harper's Ferry and declared their vow to achieve rights for all. They posed in front of the John Brown Courthouse, a huge photograph of it. This probably drove the locals crazy, you know, the sample, the whites. But that September 6th, the next month, Jasper Thompson, Father, husband, sergeant of the U.S. Colored Troops, rich infantry regiment, having fought at the crater, and whose units suffered the most casualties, who came home and became a leader in the Black community, started a, a society for uh, improvements of industry, and he created a Baptist, helped build a Baptist church for his people. A man who called himself, named, named, his name is Sarmian, uh, a man who called himself afterwards in the Virginia Free Press, a white supremacist, Tarmian, argued with Thompson over loose hogs and shot him dead. Jasper came home draped. This is Gibson Town, just a little bit before he got that uh, pump here. He came home draped over the back of his horse. And what a descendant of his said to me, for all these years, all we knew was that he came home in the back of the horse. And I found the story in, in a uh, uh, Aerial newspaper. The man spent who shot him spent six years in jail, six months in jail, but the spirit of Jasper's life and the stunning demands declared recently and nearby by W. B. Du Bois were blown in the wind. And there is the life of the old, and there is life in the old land yet. That's it. Yeah. You're on a trip. Yeah. Have you been to the replica of John Brown's gallows? I helped get, I got this uh, job for to make that. On oh, an individual's property? No. I didn't know about anything about that. Yeah, I was, my grandson was here, and I was, went to the old John Brown courthouse, and I thought the gallows was just down the street. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I walked down the street and all there was down the street was houses. So I've, uh, then I started seeing signs, John Brown's gallows in this direction. And of course they have huge houses there. And somebody has built a, uh, a replica and they, there's a sign there saying John Brown was saying here, a bronze sign. Yes. Well, oh, no, that's that's where he was hanging. Hey. Yeah, in Charlestown. Yeah, it, it's on Samuel Street. I don't remember the name of the street, but I, I was, first of all, it was dark when you were there around mm -hmm. Second Avenue. Yeah. It was this the house with the big turret and everything? It was a huge house. Yeah, that's that's and the real site. The fence. <clears throat> and then obviously new wood on the gallows. The old wood would have been wrong away years ago. But, uh, well, uh, that was there. It was just Hunter's Field then. There was nothing. Things have changed. Right. That's the <laughs> 1880s or 90s house. Yeah. And there's an old story that. Uh, the Undertaker broke it all down, and, and there's a little house kind of on Liberty Street, and he, he refactors it as a portico, all that wood around the front door. And that's pretty well documented, too. That's why nobody could find a lot about it. Yeah. I was surprised that Jowls is so far away from the courthouse. Wagon, you know, just put them in a wagon. Well, yeah, I just heard they walked out front back. They, they didn't do that. They, uh, it was at least quarter of a mile, half a mile would be the, the most way. I, yeah, because it was on the same side of the road as the courthouse? Other side of the street. Other it's okay, the, the post street office, street. all those four corners, uh, almost nothing there is what it was in the Civil War except the courthouse. 
The post office is where the jail was. It was, it was torn down and rebuilt, but it was then torn down. And then the uh, other corner was a thing called Lawyers Row, where Charlestown City Hall is. There's a little low building called Lawyers Row. But um, yeah, that's where the post office was. Then you get, we have an amazing courtroom. You go to the deed room, you can open up the exact original will of John Brown in there. And you can open it up and see all the death records and you put down occupation, adventurer, <laughs> son of a bitch. No, he didn't say that. But you see all that old handwriting. Yeah. Yeah. No. Insurrectionist. It's like looking at the 1950 census. <laughs> <laughs> so you look in the, you go open another book and you read Jane Charlotte Washington's will. Now, Vernon, you know. <laughs> Any questions? I'm, I'm glad you got what I got. You were saying earlier that uh, when this these houses were being burned, Lincoln issued an order not no more houses to be burned. Did that apply to Sherman? Because okay. the same very time, so he's he's saying, burning was, was not. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I was going to say you get the memo. The key, the key is, is that he was talking. He people always talk about Sherman in the South getting Lincoln reelected. Well, no, he, he did. He was approaching this key second election. This is August. This is what's in that November. What worried him more was early going up to Chambersburg demanding money. He went to Middletown, he went to Frederick, he hit them all up for money. And you can't get reelected president if people in the North who were voters, you're not gonna get reelected. That worried him much more than even what was going down in the Deep South, voter-wise. Yeah. I heard he got money from Hagerstown. Yeah, they just have to pay money. Please don't burn our town. Which is why he early he fled. To, he was he fled to England. Come on, yeah. But you're right. The thing is, uh, you're right. It's more than anything. You have to clear the valley of early, and this is a famous quote. Now you got to understand. This is very true. They didn't burn houses or anything. They did, did not that much destruction in our county because it's sort of like their home base of operations. But they went all through the, they took everybody's cattle, took all the fences, the Washingtons took, they only left them one milch cow in our county. But if you look carefully, they didn't burn houses. Man, they burned barns, they made thousands. The orders were, uh, uh, you, say, you can see Grant and, and Sheridan, he says, okay, look, I want it so that when you're done, a crow flying over this area will have to carry its own profit. Capiche? And that's that's just, yeah. But they def, I, I looked hard at this. They don't do the houses, but everything else, anything of industrial value. I have to say, this is really hard to listen to today in light of what's going on in Ukraine. Oh, yeah. You know, you know I that, mean, that's the good and the hard of it, right? We under, I know, especially in the last two days, that you know what? He has some rules. Oh, you never go near a woman. God help you. Or in their house, yes. But, but though they had rules, certain people didn't. But, you know, there was this whole man, manly, gentlemanly thing. But I just hate it. I hate, now do you understand the, the end of that pros account of the battle? Too often do we, again and again, do we fight you know, over and over again? That's what he's saying. Have that rock song war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. No, I really appreciate you taking this trip with me today. That's good. Thank you. So next week it's the women. Okay. Melancholic trip. It was. Here's but uh, but remember, there's there's life in the old land yet. <laughs> I think I'm going to use that again in my lifetime. Uh, thank you very much. Yep. Well, listen, before we leave, Bill, little PS, yeah, completely out of context, but we were talking about a, a core group of big slave owners sort of in force creating the secession movement. Just, just know this. I started thinking about that, and you go like this, wait a minute. Where is the global capital of the Scot Scottish Rite Freemasonry? Boston, South Carolina, the world capital. Is that right? And the president, and, and, the, and president Albert Pike, you know who the number two guy was? John C. Breckenridge, he's running for president. 
And so, and, and, and I saw the whole thing. And they proudly talk about their connection with the Klan. It's Albert Pike. So what I'm saying, just look up Albert Pike. You don't have to dig hard. There's your, there's your structure. You know? Okay. Josh, I, I, so it's uh, Scottish Rite, Southern District. I got that out of a book from it by Heather Cox Richardson. Uh -huh. It's called How the South Won the Civil War. <laughs> and it's kind of like from basically reconstruction forward. Uh, they did a great PR campaign. 